Uh, hello everyone, I'm Monty from uh, Mozilla at the moment and ziff.org. Um, I do not speak Norwegian, I'm sorry for that. Um, but that also means that uh, you should interject if uh, I'm going so, too fast. And you know, this is a small talk, so by all means, if you uh, have any immediate questions or want to chime in or your memory does not agree with mine, which is always entirely possible, you know, just wave your hands and uh, say, that's not how it was. <laughs> it happens now and then. Um, so, uh, I started uh, ziff.org, originally ziff.com, in 1994 and originally got into compression around 1993. Uh, if you don't know what ziff.org is, uh, our official uh, text says the ziff.org foundation is a not-for-profit corporation dedicated to the open, unencumbered, uh, dedicated to open, unencumbered media technologies, ziff's formats and software level the playing field for digital media so that all producers and artists can distribute their work for minimal cost without restriction or, and regardless of affiliation and it may contain, we may contain, may contain traces of nuts. Um, in reality, what ziff.org actually turns out to be is a little bit more like a cross between a coffee shop and a Masonic Lodge. We have members in the organization and a member for the most part. Uh, I don't know if this is official in the bylaws yet, but we, had, we voted on doing this. Uh, a member is anyone who has commit access. Uh, we have members who, are, who work for Mozilla, who work for IBM, who work for Netflix, who work for Google who work for Amazon, who work for Optasic, and are in the MPEG consortium, or companies in the IETF, or just individuals all around the world, and we all work on an equal footing. We get together in IRC, and have for the past 25 years, uh, entirely due to a shared love of working on Codex. And our special niche is that we want these Codex to actually be used and be useful Control is the last thing on our minds. We typically distribute codecs under BSD license and tolls under the GPL. Our licenses, although we even hold patents on some of the things that we do, our li licenses allow unrestricted use for any reason whatsoever. You do not even need to explicitly uh, ask for a license by terms of the license. The whole idea is no control, please, go use it. Um, I want to thank uh, Peter Reinholdson, who is not here. He invited me, uh, or at least was my original contact, and he may have been put up to it. And he also served as my, my personal guide in the north of Norway, uh, or a little farther north of Norway. Uh, my uh, kids and I started out at the gathering, and then came down to Oslo to give some talks, and now down to Bergen. And he showed me around and, and gave us all a wonderful time. So. When he originally invited me, uh, he, I asked him what he wanted me to present on because right now the codec that we are working on with Google and many, many others is AV1, the new video codec. And I asked him if he wanted a presentation on AV1. And he said, oh, no, that, that sounds boring. Um, <laughs> I want something more clickbaity. He said, how about something, something war stories? Uh, oh, no. Okay, war stories. Well, we're codec developers. And codec development really has very, very little in common with war. For one thing, it very seldom gets you killed. Um, a test run goes bad, something comes out the wrong color, and that's pretty much all anyone will talk about for an entire week, and this is very different from battle. Um, uh, there's actually an old story in uh, codec development, and things coming out the wrong color is a, is sort of the running joke that's been going on for more than 60 years. In the original days of the development of color television in the United States, development of the NTSC standard, never, never the same color. <laughs> the first broadcast to the public, sort of to the public, it was between the various partners from RCA out to uh, receivers that were being run by their partner companies in various parts of the United States. So the first over-the-air broadcast of the new color television system as a public demonstration. While they were setting it up, one of the engineers, I think I have his name here, um, was jo it was George Brown, uh, Dr. George Brown of RCA, who for a very brief moment had the misfortune to be bored, and bored engineers are dangerous things. While no one was looking, the bowl of fruit 
that was to be the subject of the first color television broadcast. It was simply a camera pointed at a still life of a bowl of fruit. And no one was looking, he grabbed the banana, painted it blue, and put it back without telling anybody. <laughs> no, one, no one on the engineering team at the broadcaster noticed. But everyone at the receiving teams noticed. And they spent the entire day trying to figure out what was wrong with the system that the banana was turning, the banana was turning blue in the broadcast. Um, it says something of engineers that, all, that none of them considered the possibility that the banana was actually blue. Um, to the credit of one of the teams, uh, I don't remember which one it was. Was It, it may have been Zenith. Uh, was it Zenith? Zenith and Astoria? Yeah, it was Zenith. Um, their lead engineer, uh, pulled up the signal uh, on his scope, looked at it, and said, ah, their phase is wrong, they'll fix it, and they all went out to drink. <laughs> Things turning the wrong color is, uh, it, so it's something of a running joke. But when I went to my first IETF, although by far not Ziff's first IETF in Stockholm, this was while we were uh, holding a meeting to vote on the establishment of the Codec Working Group, where the IETF and Skype and Broadcom and Ziff.org and Octasic and a few others were uh, proposing the formation of a working group to work on the Opus Audio Codec. There was a lot of opposition to this from established codec vendors, uh, especially members of the ITU, members of ISO MPEG. And of course there were a lot of, um, especially at the time, somewhat less so now after the advent of the iPhone, but at the time all these big uh, cell phone manufacturers in Scandinavia uh, and I'm, in this particular case, uh, I could name names, I won't, it wasn't Nokia. In any case, the uh, a individual came up to me and shook my hand. He said, I just wanted to meet the man who's putting us all out of work. Or, I'm sorry, specific, the quote was, who's costing all of us our jobs. And perhaps he was put up to it. Perhaps this was just a tactic to, you know, sort of put me off my game or make us think twice about what we were doing. Maybe it was, uh, you know, just a ruse. Um, I took them at face value, and, uh, and I still do. So I have a lot to say about that. None of it is snarky, and none of it is flippant, but I think it shows that, uh, sure, no one gets killed in codec development, but there are actual consequences to some of the things that we're doing. Now, um, still not going to get you killed, but people actually care. So I'm invited here to tell stories, legitimate war stories or not. Stories tend to have protagonists and antagonists, or if you want to simplify, simplify things a bit, good guys and bad guys. Uh, I think everyone can guess who the good guys are. <laughs> uh, and uh, the bad guys, I'm going to choose as a stand-in for all the bad guys. I'm going to make a composite bad guy called MBEG. Um, and this, of course, is a, is a gross oversimplification. Um, if uh, Leo Kiriglioni were, in fact, said his name wrong again, where at the back of the room he'd practically be banging the shoe on the table and screaming at me, but um, it's especially uh, awkward to just cast MPEG as the bad guys because they're not the only ones, but more than that, they started out as the good guys. They started out most definitely as the good guys. They were trying to solve the same problem back in the 80s, starting in the 80s, that uh, Ziff.org and Free Codec people are trying to solve now, which is the fact that when large research companies get together and try to try to hammer out a standard, every one of them wants as much control over it as possible. And you have to have a mediator in the middle or a set of roles or a kind of neutral ground to come together such that they can work together just enough to get that standard out. Um, and the consequence of not doing that is the kind of patent wars that we've been seeing. Now, the patent wars may not have been as bad in the 1980s as they are now. They were bad. Patent wars tend to spring up any time uh, new technology runs well ahead of the law. You know, we've, had, we've seen patent wars this bad before. Uh, the Singer Sewing Machine Company, or I should say the Singer Manufacturing Company, which is what the actual name of the company was, you know, back in the 1800s. You know, they ran roughshod all over the law and their competitors. They were as bad or worse than Microsoft ever was. Um, but unless you have a standards organization or a culture or some way of mediating the commons, the companies are going to use, especially patents, recent innovation, as, as tools and weapons against one another. And the biggest problem, at least right now, is a problem called patent holdup, where 
You have a patent that, say, is a patent on adding two numbers, accumulating them in a certain way, applied to, oh, I don't know, a filter bank that is used by MP3. Now, you have this patent. It's not particularly general use. If the patent was general use, if it was really that vague, then even the US PTO wouldn't grant it. 75% odds. But as soon as you have that patent as part of a standard MP3, for example, or rather MP1 layer 3, as an example, you suddenly have leverage over that entire standard. All you have to say is, I'm not going to license it, and the standard is dead. It's not quite that simple, but it's pretty close. And we're not just talking about one patent at a time. We're talking about, for example, an HEVC, tens of thousands of patents that have not yet been accounted for in a patent pool. HEVC, at this point, has three patent pools, one of which on and off, I'm sorry, two of which on and off keep saying that they're going to be charging uh, streaming royalties. Right now, both of them says, say they don't, but they've changed their minds before. But these three, pat uh, these three patent pools don't even account for a majority of the known patents in HEVC. And that doesn't say anything about the unknown patents. It's become a complete free-for-all. MPEGs and the ITUs and others like 3GPP, their great sin in all of this is simply that they've refused to adapt. They came up with a system where they said, we make the best standard possible. We're not allowed to talk about patents at all. The MPEG is a technical organization. Patent licensing does not enter into anything we do. To handle patent licensing, we'd like to introduce you to these other people, the MPEG Licensing Authority. Completely different company, nothing to do with us, despite the fact that it's exactly the same people meeting in exactly the same places. But they'll handle all of it at the end. And the complete free-for-all we see right now is a combination of software patents becoming absolutely ubiquitous over you know, some fairly trivial things, which is the real problem. The, obvious, the obviousness criteria is good and dead. But also because the MPEG itself is not allowed to uh, take any of this into account. We leave it to the end. We have to take it into account. We have to take it into account throughout the entire process. If uh, we're going to function in a system where software patents are a real thing, we have to be aware of software patents. If we could get rid of software patents, well, then that's something else entirely. Whether or not they're a good idea in theory, I think we can all agree that in practice they're proving to be something of an unmitigated disaster, and it's only getting worse. Um, you know, Sisvel has just come out of the woodwork and said, oh, we've got clients with software patents that uh, are going to assert these against AV1. And that was even after, uh, well, first off, I, there's, there's not really much to that. And Google would honestly like Sisvel to just disappear from the news cycle because they don't think they have anything. I don't think they have anything. We entered the development of AV1 eyes wide open. We may have had more lawyer hours involved in researching and avoiding video patents than in actually developing the standard. Um, so I don't think they have much of a leg to stand on, but there we are. Patents are obviously a big problem. We need to minimize it. If we can't get rid of software patents, we need to minimize the problem as best possible. And MPEG isn't even trying. So they're part of the problem. Um, so MPEG, they're going to be the bad guys. Well, we'll bring them up a couple of times. I started on compression in 93. In 94, we formed, oh god, I hope that's not me. Nope, okay. In 94, uh, I uh, filed the corporate paperwork to start .com. And back then it was .com. I, it's not that I really wanted to make money on Codex. It was more that uh, everyone was bringing up .com. But I thought, hey, you know, maybe there's some way to monetize some part of it to fund the rest. Um, the first codec was a lossless codec that I was working on. Uh, there was another lossless codec at the time called Shorten. And this was all about, the motivation for all of this was that uh, I, I'm a musical theater guy. I absolutely love rock opera. And I spend a lot of time as, as a sound man for community theater. And nothing much more serious than that. A few semi-professional acts, you know, I've been paid for it. But it's not a living, it's, it's something that I do for fun. And I wanted to record things. This was in the late 80s, early 90s. PCs were just coming to the point where, you know, we had 16-bit cup sound cards, the very originals, the Sound Blaster 16, Pro Audio Spectrum 16, yeah, 16 bits, that was enough to do something with. And, okay, hard drives were not there. I, I saved up almost two years to buy a one gigabyte hard drive. And 
And as it turns out, this was one gigabyte hard drive. I bought it off of Usenet. And it turns out to have been a prototype that was stolen from uh, Connor Systems. But uh, <laughs> I, I had firmware trouble with it. Uh, it was a Connor 1050, which is a model that never existed. Uh, I had firmware trouble with it, so I called up Connor customer support, and I said, where did you get this? Uh, so well, I bought it off of Usenet, and uh, who did you buy it from? <laughs> and uh, they very graciously simply mentioned that that was a model number that didn't exist. And why don't I send that back to them, and they'll just send me a one gig drive of a model that does exist? Which they did. Um, the, uh, but one gigabyte was not enough to really record all that much sound, especially losslessly. This machine was a 386. Uh, not a lot of hardware uh, processing power there either, but I thought, well, if I'm going to fit much on this hard drive, I mean, I can't even record an entire show on this thing, I'm going to have to compress it. So I went out and looked at compressions. MP3 just existed at the time. I downloaded Disk 8 and I downloaded Disk 10, which were the uh, distributions that were associated with the ISO standard. Um, the standard ISO standards require that you publish reference source code with your codex. And so this, this was a part of the reference. The news media at the time was reporting MP3 as something that had been liberated by hackers, that the, some guy had stolen the source and posted it on the net for other hackers to use to, uh, I'm not really sure where that came from given that publishing the source code was required. But anyway, I logged on to the MPEG's own FTP site and just downloaded the source code. Um, and I was not impressed by it. Layer one was supported by practically nothing. Layer two was not a lot of compression, but you could still tell that it was compressed. There was obvious loss there. Layer three was absolutely horrible. The, the disk 10 layer three was, was barely usable, and it wasn't particularly fast. And I thought, oh, well, if this is the state of the art in lossy compression, I don't want lossy compression. So I started working on lossless compression. It became apparent that lossless compression can't really do that much. You can burn all the, the uh, the processor time that you want, but when it comes right down to it, lossless compression is limited to compressing out things in the sound that aren't random, and sounds have a lot of random noise in them, especially if you go fairly deep. You know, a 16-bit sample, that's already a couple bits of noise coming out of almost any consumer microphone. And all these people saying, oh, I want a 32-bit DAC. Well, you realize even your 24-bit DAC is still three bits of noise for the cleanest sound signals known to man. Um, in any case, uh, so lossless wasn't going that far, and as I'm watching the different codecs, I'm seeing that things are improving rather rapidly. It's like, oh, this is, this, is a, this is a field of active research. A lot is happening here. A friend of mine at MIT, Greg Hudson, came up to me and said, oh, you're working on compression. There, you know, there are really no good libraries for that out on the net for people to use. Uh, what are you working on? And I said, oh, well, I'm just doing this for recording. He said, do you have anything working? And I said, yeah, I have some things working. He said, well, why don't you throw it up on the net? And I thought, yeah, that's a good idea. If no one else has this and it's useful, uh, I'll spend a weekend on it. And that was in 1994. In, uh, and it's been 25 years since then, we're still not done. But working on that, uh, I threw it up, graduated from MIT, went off to grad school. I went to grad school in Japan. I went to Tokyo Institute of Technology, Tofodai. And one of the professors there was uh, uh, Saruaki Furuisa, uh, Furui Sensei. He was a uh, uh, professor uh, so, uh, attached to the university and also working for uh, Nippon Telephone and Telegraph. His specialty was speech compression. My laboratory was working on formal verification, which seemed interesting at the time, but as I continued through my grad school experience, uh, I was taking classes from Furui Sensei and finding the formal verification was not really where I wanted to be. Um, he took me to NTT, to his laboratory, to show off things he was working on. And he knew I was working on compression. This was, this was you know, why we were even talking, because I was very interested in compression. Many of his students were taking his class because compression was interesting, but it was no, I was into compression. So it's so, like, hey, come to my lab. Um, he showed me his nascent uh, speech recognition system that they were working on at NTT. So it, when you call up somebody and a machine answers and the voice recognition working over the telephone, he developed the, the first system for doing that that actually worked in real time. Uh, it wasn't working in real time then, but then you know we're talking about 386s. Um, and he showed me a laboratory where they were working on a new uh, general purpose audio compression, which was a big deal at the time, but nobody remembers now, uh, 
called TwinVQ. It was going to be, uh, it was the big competitor to MP3, replace MP3, same as Fraunhofer was working on advanced audio coding AAC. And uh, he took me through the laboratory, and the first thing I noticed that uh, grabbed my attention was whenever one of the students looked up and, and heard the introduction, he turned his monitor screen around. <laughs> so I couldn't see what he was working on. And that was a wonderful, wonderful thing. Oh, I felt like I was being taken seriously. It was so cool. Um, so he wouldn't tell me that much about TwinVQ, and he couldn't. But he's a speech coding professor, and he talked about TwinVQ in the classes that he was teaching, and I pieced together pretty well how it actually worked. And eventually, of course, they had to publish how it worked as part of the standard. Uh, you can't have a reference without people actually knowing what's going on under the, the covers. And it was pretty much the way that I expected. There were some interesting techniques there, a couple fatal flaws, which is why it never really went anywhere. But even if you, if you look at Vorbis, which was our first successful codec, you can see lots of traces, well, more than traces, of TwinVQ in there. And the process of writing the Vorbis codec was how I figured out what the flaws in TwinVQ were and that they couldn't be fixed. And that is why TwinVQ failed, in my humble opinion, um, after finishing graduate school, or rather, uh, getting a degree in graduate school, I did not finish. What I did not understand fully starting grad school in Japan was there are no master's students. There are doctorate students who are currently working for their masters. I was in a laboratory that was no longer doing what it was I wanted to do. I wanted to do uh, codex, and it was graduate school that made that very apparent. Simply leaving the program with one degree was not something that was done, and I really hope that this did not cause my laboratory any heartache because it was a bit of a minor scandal. What you mean you're leaving? It's like I've got my degree, the scholarship ends, and as far as I can tell, the, uh, the visa wants me out of the country. I'm like, well, didn't you? So anyway, I left, and, and uh, I, I literally picked, uh, grabbed my degree during the awards ceremony and ran for the airport. Um, not because I needed to get out, but because the timing was that tight on when my visa expired. Uh, it, it wasn't supposed to be the visa that I was using at the time. I was supposed to have already applied for everything I need for the needed for the doctorate. Um, grabbed my visa, ran to the airport, came back to the United States, got a day job as a programmer. Um, and continued working on compression. And I was still taken with the idea of finding some way of funding this. I had seen that codecs were advancing rapidly, and so I didn't want to write a codec. I wanted to write a system for writing codecs, as young tool makers are often wont to do. Um, Postscript was still something of a trendy thing at the time. The real hackers didn't uh, use, didn't use Inkscape or the GIMP. I don't know if Inkscape uh, existed yet. Maybe it did, maybe it didn't. But they wrote PostScript directly. If you wanted to do something graphical output, you just wrote PostScript. And I thought, well, PostScript exists, and it can describe pictures. We can write something that describes sound. So I had been working on a system for describing sound and signal processing transforms in its own specialized language with the idea that you didn't have hard-coded codecs written in or compiled to binary. You had a codec description in the header of the file that it would decode. The code and the data would come along together. Good idea, bad idea, as an older programmer, bad idea. But at the time, that's what I was working on, and I tried to sell it to people. There was a company called Arepa that was doing in 1996 what Steam and Origin eventually succeeded in. They were trying to stream on-demand video games. Um, we presented to Apple. Rickland and Mike Person and I think Michael Whitson came along, and I gathered up the one notebook we had between us, which was my, uh, this, this awful, awful thing made by Clevo, um, and went off to Apple to present Stormbringer, which was our codec description language, to the QuickTime group. And Peter Hottie and a couple of others were there, and the notebook crashed in the middle of the presentation. It was not going well in general, and there's a little commotion out in the hallway. And, you know, a couple of the QuickTime people go out forth through a door, I can't see who's on the other side. And one of my guys, I think it was Rickland, said, it's Steve. And so a question comes in, and one of them says, well, can it do MP3? I said, well, it could do MP3. It's a codec description language. You can write any codec in it that you want. He said, no, 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 no. Does it do MP3 right now? I said, no. And I heard from the hallway, eh, it sucks. <laughs> And that was the end of the presentation. <laughs> and, uh, 
and that was that was probably about the end of us working on Codex for about a year and a half because I didn't know what to do after that. That was uh, quite a lesson. Steve Jobs, who I never met and talked to in person, that was the very closest. We had we had, we had several run-ins with him actually. There's there's some amount of Steve interaction uh, throughout the history of Ziff.org until uh, he died uh, some years ago. Uh, I never met him in person, but I long said that the real reason people Business people especially hated Steve Jobs was not just that he was a jerk. He was, and a world-class one. But the reason that they hated Steve Jobs was that he was right more often than they were. And it's infuriating. Um, if you really think about it, how many times did he reinvent Apple's uh, product portfolio successfully? Uh, building a company of that size once is a hell of an achievement. I think he did it, by my count, at least four times. And that's really something. That's a track record that almost nobody uh, gets to. Um, so I thought about this. I think he was on time number three when, when this happened, two or three. So I thought about it, and I didn't know what to do about it. I didn't know where to go from there. And so there was the wandering through the, uh, the wandering through the wasteland, waiting for the promised land to uh, appear. How long have I been going on that nothing exciting has happened in any of this yet? Uh, about half an hour. Uh, we're, we're coming up to some good stuff. There's some lawsuits in here. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, in September, I think it was, of 1998 is when Thompson and Fraunhofer sent the famous letters to all the free MP3 encoder projects that said cease and desist. And if you do not, we will take you to court for patent infringement. And they all shut down practically overnight. And I knew about that the same day because I had friends in codec development. I had watched and tracked MP3 development very carefully. They were the state of the art. Even if I didn't think much of the lossy compression at the time, they were still the state of the art. Um, I found out about it in, uh, almost immediately. Uh, I think it may have been Mark Taylor who told me, or maybe I hadn't met him. <coughs> but it was, it was literally that moment I knew exactly what codec I had. <coughs> we needed to write a replacement for MP3. It had to be as good as MP3, at least. Uh, probably better, because I didn't think much of MP3 at the time. Uh, and it had to be absolutely free, without strings, without restrictions for anyone to use. Um, JPEG succeeded because it was free. It didn't start out that way. Uh, the original JPEG standard baseline was royalty bearing. Another group came along, the independent JPEG group, and looked at the standard and said, well, we can't use that part. There are obvious patents on that. We can't use that part. This part's good. This part's good. They assembled a royalty-free baseline out of the JPEG's standard. That IJG distribution is what everyone ended up using for a good 15 years. There was practically no other implementation unless it was embedded. There have been many royalty-bearing updates of JPEG. None of them have replaced the original. No other image format has replaced JPEG, despite the fact that it's 30 years old. Nothing's come close. There are things that are better, but they haven't come close to unseating it. What MPEG has done since then with MP3 is, is kind of sneaky. They have, there's, there's a maxim in the United States, it could only be in the United States, don't sue poor people. Um, and yeah, it's one of those bits of dark humor that there's a couple layers there. Um, and and MPEG apparently has taken that to heart because they didn't sue any of the poor people, they didn't go after individuals, they were only interested in making sure that the biggest companies that were outside their protective moat were paying attention. And I learned this when I was working for a company called the Green Witch Internet Radio. We were one of the first streaming sites online where you could go to a website, click a button, and listen to radio. Some of the radio was curated uh, streams of particular genres. Some of the radio was being put together by live humans. Uh, there wasn't any interactive radio so much. There was some interactive-ish thing going on there. It wasn't like paper radio or something. But, it was, it was popular at the time, you know, the web had been discovered, this was in the middle of the bubble, there was money to be had, there were startups springing up all around internet music. And then, uh, Fraunhofer, uh, not Fraunhofer, Thompson, bought an interest in one of our competitors, which was actually just across the street, Music Match. The Music Match jukebox had an associated uh, radio station division, they streamed on the internet too. We had been paying a few thousand dollars a year up to that point for the rights to use an MP3 encoder. It was one of front offers. I believe it was one of front offers. And it didn't matter whose it was. We owned royalties because that's the way MP3 worked. Um, 
And when, uh, when Thompson bought an interest in one of our competitors, suddenly we were competing with the MPEG consortium. And so it turns out that uh, we've been getting a discount, like practically everyone. The list price on that software was not a few thousand dollars a year. It turned out it was 60 million a year. <laughs> and suddenly we were going to pay list price. Um, that was the first moment when I realized that free, reasonable, and non-discriminatory means fuck all in the real world. Free, reasonable, and non-discriminatory is not in any sense of the word defined, not even roughly. It's if a group of people, and different groups of people are going to come up to very different answers, get together and say, yeah, that sounds good, which is a lousy way to be regulating patent law. Um, Certainly, if a couple of us get together and say, well, what should this cost? It's going to be very different than if the CEO of Thompson, the CEO of Apple, the CEO of Phillips, the CEO of whomever get together and say, what should this cost? And uh, possibly the biggest difference between those who are, who is outside of the MPEG mode and who is inside. And that's when we realize that it's not about the money. It's about the control. Money is a side effect of the control. It's, uh, it, it, people took Mozilla to task for the longest time saying, why don't you offer H.264 in your browser? You know, eventually we found a loophole, or rather, uh, uh, Cisco found a loophole. And Cisco paid through the teeth for that loophole. But Mozilla was willing to pay the money. There were other things in the license that we couldn't agree to. We had to track every copy that got downloaded. Because their license terms made us uh, an arm of their patent enforcement. If we were aware of patent violations in our downloaded products, we had to report that to the uh, individual members of the MPEG consortium that were licensing these patents. Uh, we, we had to track downloads, we had to count them. There would be no more downstream. You were not allowed to derive the, uh, the Firefox code, or at least you wouldn't be allowed to use any of the media extensions that were attached to MP3. These were things that we just couldn't agree to. It had nothing to do with the money. We were happy to pay the money. And Mozilla's got the money to pay for the license these licenses were designed at a time when, who are your customers? Broadcast television stations. What did you sell? A box that they plugged into something. What did you think of it after that? Not at all. It worked until the box fell over, and then you bought it to one. Software is completely incompatible with the licensing regime that, uh, that, that spawned that. In any case, oh, the other thing we learned at uh, uh, the Greenwich Internet Radio is that if you need a large CD changing robot, Chances are you're in a big city, and if you're in a big city, there's probably an art school down the road, and when they let out for the summer, the graduate students there are way, way cheaper and far more robust than any CD change world. <laughs> um, when I joined the uh, Greenwich uh, Internet Radio, I thought they were hiring me for Vorbis. No, they were using CD Paranoia, which was a program I had written a few years before because it was really, really difficult to get clean rips out of a computer CD player. They, they skipped all over the place, so I wrote one that didn't. And Everyone in the free world uses that except for uh, the Windows people. There are free software people in Windows. They use uh, EAC, which is a different program. No, nothing in common with CD Paranoia. It does the same thing, came a few years later. Works just as well, by the way. Um, but we had 140,000 CDs left to rip into our library, every one of which had been purchased legally by hand at a local, at, at, at a local music shop. Uh, and we were putting all these all into our library, one at a time, to a CD drive, close the door, press rip. When it's done, it ejects. Take it. So the art students did that. Anyway, we, we were not prepared to pay the 60 million. The company got bought by iCast a little before that. iCast was one of these big internet bubble companies that managed to burn a quarter billion dollars in something like nine months. They disappeared very quickly. Well, you know, weird things happen when mob money gets involved, and an awful lot of the uh, the uh, Silicon Valley is mob fueled, uh, which is kind of a kind of an uncomfortable open secret. Um, there are two ways in the United States that the organized crime launders money. One, for the most part, is uh, it used to be gambling, not so much anymore. Now it's real estate and internet startups. In any case, um, that blew up. I moved back to New England because New England is home living in Boston at the time. Um, we continued. 
we were still good engineers. We weren't employed by anybody. None of us had jobs anymore, but that's okay. I know the one will come along. We're good at what we do and we're enjoying what we're doing. We got a little bit of money out of the bubble. I was able to pay off my student loans. Wonderful thing. I was not the least bit upset about what had just happened. We were still on an upward curve and we kept developing. Uh, we had more people coming into the organization. At one point, we had a video codec that didn't go so well. When I started Vorbis, we also started a video codec called Tarkin. Tarkin from uh, Star Wars, those of you who uh, don't, don't follow it that closely. Uh, Grand Moff Tarkin was the one person who Vader, Darth Vader wasn't afraid of on the original Death Star. Played by Peter Cushing. Marvelous performance, even if he was only on screen a very short period of time. Um, Tarkin was our video codec. It was a three-dimensional video codec. The idea was, well, sound is a wave, and it's just a bunch of points on a line. Video is a square arrangement of pixels, and it, or I'm sorry, a still image is a single square arrangement of pixels, and video is just several still images after each other, so if you stack up those planes, you have pixels this direction, this direction, this direction, three dimensions. You can transform that the same way you can transform something in three dimensions, so, or in two dimensions. So we'll do that. We'll eliminate motion compensation. We have a simple system for taking video to the next level, and we tried it, and it was horrifying. <laughs> the biggest problem was the artifacts because, of course, in a lossy codec, things are ringing and you, you get a little bit of stippling over here, a little stippling over here, and noise gets sprayed in some directions, but now it's being sprayed in time. So people didn't so much move from one place to another. What you saw was sort of a collection of human colored sand that shifted <laughs> from one place to another, not entirely in sync. Limbs moved without faces. It was, it was, it, when Google released Deep Dream, that was one of the first things that I thought of, the Deep Dream, the neural network that was supposed to enhance images, but instead just painted eyeballs and everything. <laughs> it was a little bit like that. And I remember the first time I'm looking at this with Jack, who I was developing with, and he's just like, that's horrifying. <laughs> so it didn't really go any, we, we continued playing with it for a while, but it was clear that this was not the direction to go. Eventually, we contact, uh, contacted On2, formerly of the Duck Company, many years later to be bought by Google. On2 was working on video codecs. They had a codec called VP3, which they wanted to open source for reasons that weren't entirely clear to us, but they tried to do this on their own. They open sourced VP3 with an open source licensing, uh, an open source license that only a commercial company could come up with. I think that we're all familiar with those. Nobody paid it any really good attention. They were mostly criticized for how awful their license was. And at one point, one of the people who was in the organization at the time, Amy Plant, just called them up and said, hey, we'll take it. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, give it to us. Make, we'll, we'll take your codec. And to our surprise, uh, they said, sure. Now it turns out that On2 had a uh, uh, service maintenance contract associated with VP3 that they also wanted to get rid of. And Emmett, either to his, uh, to his uh, credit or to our dismay, and it actually turned out to be to his credit, said, sure, we'll take that contract too. And as it turns out, there was very little that we had to work with. But we had a video product now. Theora, uh, VP3, we renamed it Theora, and we rewrote it. It was a 1998 era codec, it had motion compensation, it had, a couple, it had a lot of idiosyncrasies. I think the best way to describe Onto's codex, even up to now, is highly idiosyncratic. Um, but it wasn't a bad codec at the time, we took it on, this was in 2002. In 2004, we released it as Theora, had it completely rewritten it and made it much faster. And uh, that was our video codec for a while. It was better received than when On2 had started working on it, but still not incredibly well. Um, one of the complaints that we heard about it was that it was proprietary. Now, that was a strange thing to say, proprietary. This is open source. Anyone's allowed to do anything they want with it. There are literally no restrictions on this codec. There were patents associated with it, which On2 also gave to us. Yeah, take it, yours. Um, and we had put out a license saying, you may use these patents for any uh, purpose whatsoever, we're just gonna hold them in defense. Literally no restrictions. You didn't even have to ask us to use it. Um, but they're calling it proprietary. Well, why is that? Well, it was the product of a single organization. Well, how is MPEG layer one not the product of a single organization? Well, MPEG can, it contains lots of organizations, I see. We contain lots of organizations. And they said, no, 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 this codex sucks. 
It's from 1998. It's proprietary, and oh, by the way, did we mention it sucks? They said, no, it is not proprietary. <laughs> <laughs> and this argument went on for a while. Um, now, the proprietary argument was bogus. But the sucks argument was not entirely off base. It was an old codec. And on to design something that wasn't half bad, uh, certainly not by 1998 standards, it was pretty good by then standards. But uh, they, I don't think they were very good at writing encoders. And we wrote a much better one. We started working on it. It became clear we had to work on one. We absolutely had to improve this if anyone was going to take it seriously. And we started Thisnelda. Thisnelda was just a release name. It was still Theora. So it was Theora, Thisnelda. And this is, this is where people start beginning to. So you've named your codex Vorbus and Tarkin and Theora and Thisnelda. And someone started a, a Reddit thread about this. It's like, Thisnelda really got us. I have some quality, equally appealing suggestions for the new release names. You can have them here. Snubflog, Brathafrage, Debortnax, uh, Toliform, and Nordwat. Uh, I think we used at least three of those <laughs> in the, the following, because uh, after Thisnelda was released, the next version of Theora was named uh, Toliform. Uh, there was a release of uh, Vorbis that was named Snupflog. So we thought that those were great. Those had legs. <laughs> we also got lots of other suggestions for what to name our codex. When we first released uh, Og Vorbis, which I have to admit you know, is, a, is a kind of strange name, and it was strange on purpose, it's the kind of thing you can only really get, rid of, get away with once you have to be the only person doing it, and because if everyone is doing it, it just sounds like all tech company names. Um, Anyway, the, but there was a guy who suggested I have a I have a killer kick-ass name for your next codec. The guarantee is it will be it will be successful. You should name it Free MP3. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing about naming it Free MP3 was, aside from the fact that it was a terrible name, was the we didn't want to be associated with MP3. When MP3 when Vorbis first came out, our first release, it was noticed by the press and the press started covering it, and it was a little strange. Uh, streamingmedia.com, I'm not sure how big that is outside the United States, but it's a fairly large news site for this segment of the industry in the US. Uh, one of their first magazine issues, they, you know, they profiled what we were doing, and at the time, they were interested in Jack Moffat and I, uh, Icecast, but Vorbis made it into there too. Uh, one of the funny things about that is they, uh, in the first run, they misspelled the name, they called it Ogdorbus. And I'm not sure if that's a better name or worse, honestly. It's just not the right name. Um, they, uh, they and some others re uh, had headlines along the lines of uh, hackers release new, uh, new free MP3 format. And that caused us a lot of trouble. And the trouble it caused us specifically was, well, the first thing someone did was go to Penny, uh, uh, Penny Linda, uh, who was a VP of Thompson in charge of multimedia, and asked him, well, what do you think of this? And he reads the headline and he says, free MP3? Well, they can't do that. That, that would infringe. And given only that piece of information, that it's a free implementation of MP3, he was right. It would infringe. But it wasn't. He didn't know anymore. He was you know, speaking just off the top of his head. It was reported everywhere that, of course, we're infringing. We would have to be. This expert, this VP of a, of a global organization has said so. Now, to his credit, uh, Henry Linda did go out and figure out what this was about. He did a little research into Orbis and realized that it was its own completely separate implementation that actually technologically had very little in, com in common with MP3. It uh, had much more in common actually with TwinVQ. That's what I knew uh, sort of growing up. And he did say publicly that, oh, I, this Orbis thing, it's, uh, it has nothing to do with MP3 and that's okay. It was reported in a single German language newspaper and I didn't, I didn't save a copy because I can no longer find any reference to it anywhere on the net. It's, it's a skew of what gets reported and what doesn't that's just maddening at times. The clickbait sells. Thank you, Peter. Uh, let's continue because we were past the Nordwatt. But at the same time that, uh, that uh, the weird reporting started, so did all the patent food put, FUD, pushback, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Um, and of course, the general assertion was that, well, they can't do this. There are a bunch of amateurs, you know, a bunch of kids. We're all 20 years old, running around, writing codecs, um, living off of savings. Um, jobs come and go. 
And uh, there's no way that a bunch of part-timer amateurs could possibly be getting around this patent thicket that the MPEG and the ITU are very purposely sowing. Um, I mean, Steve Jobs weighed in on that again. Um, Hugo Roy, he was with the Free Software Foundation, he said, we had nothing to do with this, but he just fired off an email to Steve Jobs saying, what's all this about uh, Fisnel, though? Uh, Theora, why don't you use it? You're talking about, you know, getting rid of uh, Adobe Flash and you're going to need a video codec. Why not use uh, Theora? It's free. It's, uh, well, it's better than VB6 in, uh, in Flash anyway. Um, especially since you're supporting HTML5 and open standards. May I remind you that H.264 is not an open standard? Roy wrote in a missive posted to the web, the video codec is covered by patents, and this is why Mozilla, Firefox, and Opera can't adopt it. So Roy sent this off to Steve Jobs and astoundingly got a response because Steve Jobs actually responded to these things. He paid attention and read his own uh, email. If you sent him something that was interesting, he'd write right back. Steve wrote, all the video codecs are covered by patents. A patent pool is being assembled right now to go after Theora and the other open source codecs. Unfortunately, just because something is open source, it doesn't mean or guarantee that it doesn't infringe on others' patents. An open standard is different from being royalty free or open source. Leaving aside the fact that his final two statements are absolutely correct, um, he is using a number of absolutely correct statements to cast fear, uncertainty, and doubt on a format that was, in fact, free and clear of all patents. Um, this was 15 years ago now. A patent pool is being assembled right now. Said the same thing about Borders. Said the same thing about VP8 five years later. And now they're saying the same thing about uh, AV1 five years after that. Now, to be fair, mm -hmm. VP8. Nokia and a bunch of others did too. Florian Mueller, uh, especially, uh, made a big deal of this on his Foss Patents blog. And I'm not actually going to go after Fl uh, Florian too, too much here because he sort of plays whatever side gets the most clicks. And I guess that's what journalists do these days. Um, and there were a lot of articles about it. Uh, did you know that Google won all those cases? No, because he didn't report it. Just throwing that out there. So Jobs wrote back, and he wrote back, well, you know, just because it's open source doesn't mean it's patent-free, that's true. And in fact, uh, you can even look at Theora and say, well, there were patents, of course. Ziff.org helped them. You could look at VP8 and say, of course, there were patents. Google helped them. They did. Um, before On2 got bought by Google, actually, we had been con in contact with them. You know, they were sort of doing the same thing on the commercial side that we were doing on uh, the free codec side. We're trying to make our way. They're trying to make uh, make a buck and stay relevant and, and stay in business. They had VP6, which got into Flash and did fairly well. Uh, they were up to VP8 at that point. And it's like, well, you know, we're feeling not so much like where ha it has been, but like we're really not breaking through. And I'm going to guess from your commercial positioning that you guys are feeling kind of the same way. Fiora did okay, but we can do better now. Why don't you give us all the VP8 patents? And we'll take VP8. And to our surprise, they wrote back, and we were talking about this. I don't think they would have done that. I don't think they would have gone through with it. I think they were still hoping for, for something else. And, uh, <laughs> and that, that may have worked out just fine, because uh, suddenly the email stopped coming. So they just didn't write back. Like, hey, guys, guys, you're still there? Did we say something? I, I really thought that we had pissed them off. You know, we'd finally stepped over the line. It's like, give us your entire commercial portfolio, and we'll, we'll give it to everyone for free. Doesn't that sound great? And... Uh, <laughs> But, and then in December it turned out that they'd been bought by Google. And I thought, oh, well, how do I feel about that? Well, everyone hates Google now, which is a little strange. I would say that everyone not trusting Google is the right call. Google is a big company that until recently had the motto, don't be evil, uh, very famously, don't be evil, and just as famously, seems to have backed off from that. They have discovered the wonderful flexibility that being amoral gives them. Uh, kind of necessary when you get that large. Uh, I wouldn't say that Google is evil. Now, I, I don't think they are. Amoral, that's a good way to put it. Perhaps not guilty, definitely not innocent. That's, that's a good summary. 
Um, I would advise anyone who, who is thinking of working with Google, talking to Google, to of course be wary. I don't think Google intentionally screws people over. I think Google promises the world without any ability or intention of delivering it. Uh, I've seen this happen to a bunch of uh, programmers. They tried the same thing on us, of course, you know, not our first rodeo, not a big deal. Um, I think that's what happened with uh, the, uh, the programmer who accused Google of stealing uh, our ANS from him. Uh, I've had a lot of thoughts on that, and you know, some people agree with me, a lot of people don't. If I had to choose dealing with Google now or working with Microsoft of the mid-90s, though, there's no question it's Google now. It'll, that'll probably change. You know, the, is the potential there for them to become as bad as Microsoft? Oh, yes. But are they? No. And, then, and Microsoft, to some extent, is, is reformed. This is the weirdest thing. People still bash on them, but they're doing a lot of things right these days. They cooperated with Opus. Heck, when we were working with Opus, their biggest fear was not getting sued by somebody else. It, suing somebody over Opus, I don't think it had ever in any sense occurred to them, which is new for Microsoft. Um, Google bought uh, onto and got the P8. Then Google said, and we're open sourcing VP8, and we went like, oh. okay, this is a good development. Suddenly, open codecs have a very big protector in one side. Now, maybe it's a, pr a protector who's, who you can't trust, and it's not because they're not trustworthy, it's because you are so small, they don't even really notice you. There's danger in that, too, but open codecs finally have someone with a lot of self-interest and a lot of legal ability protecting them. So, in a sense, that's turned out to be a good thing, and of course, they tried to standardize, standardize VP8, pull people into the VP8 uh, realm. And that got sabotaged by YouTube, which was kind of funny. YouTube said, no, we're going to lose viewers, so no. And Google's higher-ups looked at it and said, YouTube makes money, you don't, YouTube wins. And that's what happened there. And that's a gross simplification, that's more or less what happened. But the on two people within Google have continued working on this and continue working on this. And finally, we are up to AV1. And for the longest time, Zift.org was thinking, we have Fiora, we've done good work on it, we've actually brought this 1998 codec up to competing with the baseline of H.264, the medium complexity. But we knew that once high complexity devices came out, we probably couldn't match that. We knew that was coming. It hadn't come yet, but there's the, is this going to turn out bad or is this going to turn out good? Google bought on two open source VP8 and suddenly everyone exhaled, it's like, Someone else is going to be taking all the fire. What are we going to do with our new breather? Because now we have maneuvering room, we have space to do something else. We don't have to keep pouring all of our resources into Theora. The new cycle has turned on to something else. It's going to be VP8. Everyone's going to worry about that for a little while. What do we do now? And the answer was we started a new audio codec, Opus. While developing Vorbis, I had a stack of technical, uh, uh, technical publications from MPEG, which I studied closely, all the public stuff, all the, all the papers the researchers wrote, uh, everything that you could get from a university download, as well as TwinVQ and AC3 and a whole bunch of others. And in the process of writing my own codec, or I should say it was the process of writing my own codec to realize that that entire stack of public information from MPEG was, was bullshit. Um, it was all very plausible. But for the most part, it was not how any of the commercial codecs worked. Their reference implementation, disk 10, implemented what the, what the public technical stack said. And the publications, especially the marketing stuff from MPEG, went on and on about, you know, globally optimized noise distribution, minimizing quantization error over the spectrum with an iterative loop that looks for the optimal solution across the scale factors. And they go into a lot of technical information of how it works even enough to write your own codec, which was kind of surprising. The problem is you would end up writing a very bad encoder if you did it that way. None of the commercial encoders did it that way. The public one did. The commercial ones did not. Um, and in, it, took the, it took writing Vorbis to realize that all that information was subtly, very subtly, incorrect. Uh, years later, I asked uh, an MPEG person about this, a person from Fraunhofer Research, and I said, so all the stuff about the optimization loop, the, the, I said, that was all an intentional misdirection, wasn't it? And he said, oh yeah, no hesitation. Yeah, it, that was all red arrow. It was just to throw off people who were outside the moat. But we had figured that out 
uh, in the process of writing Vorbis. And of course, we told what we found to the associated uh, free MP3 coders. Lame certainly still continued on. Uh, the Lame encoder uh, benefited from Vorbis just as much as Vorbis benefited from the Lame encoder. Um, the thing that we found that was most valuable in an audio codec was maintaining uh, and, and holding steady the overall energy in any one critical hearing band. Uh, that's technical information that will mean nothing to anyone except an audio coder. But if you're an audio coder here in the audience and you didn't know that already, that is probably the single thing necessary to know to make uh, an encoder that sounds good. None of that had been published before. It was a, it was a trade secret. And uh, that instantly made Lane better. It instantly made Vorbis better. The problem was Vorbis had not been structurally designed to take advantage of it. We discovered that very late. Vorbis could do it, but it only did it inefficiently. And so we had known from that time that eventually we would need another codec. When I started Vorbis, 128 kilobits? MP3 sounded good at 128 kilobits? Impossible, it'll never happen. I was astounded when we found ways to make that work. Getting down to 128 kilobits and being transparent or near it was something I thought would never happen. And then we got there. And then we got down to 96 and 64 in Vorbis. And it's like, at this point, you know, packet overhead is taking up most of our space. We need to design another codec to get around that. And we started two. I started one called Ghost. John Mark started one called Opus, or rather, at the time it was called Gout. Um, I was doing something very aggressive, didn't, uh, very ambitious, didn't go anywhere. Jean-Marc worked on Kelt and just blew it out of the water. He nailed it. He made right decision after right decision after right decision. Um, you know, it's like, do I do A or do I do B? Which one is better? I don't know. I'll do one and figure out later if it was the right decision. And he, uh, either by just intuition or luck, got each one of those right. And, and wrote Kelt. We got together with Skype, added speech features into it, became Opus, went to the IATF, the, uh, the famous thing in Stockholm, you're putting us all out of work. And, uh, and, so, and that was the, uh, the, the codec that we ended up writing in the breather time that we got from Google buying onto and releasing VP8. Um, one of the nifty things about Opus is we discovered just three years ago that 3GPP's next generation enhanced voice services for all cell phones, the worldwide cell phone standard, it's built on Opus. <laughs> we didn't mention it to anyone. Uh, or I should say partially, of course it's not just Opus. Uh, jean marc was looking through papers at one of their special sessions in an ICASP, uh, I ICASP convention and noticed that a whole bunch of them were referencing Opus as an implementation reference. And so he downloaded the source code because of course you need the source code to have a reference implementation. He downloaded the source code, and there was the libopus reference source, source staring back at him, complete with his comments and the spellings. <laughs> and they'd stripped off our, cop our copyright, which kind of annoyed us. So uh, we contacted them and said, you're using our stuff. That's kosher, but the copyright has to go back. And just like every commercially funded organization we've ever run into, did they simply put the two-line copyright on there? No, they rewrote all the code that they left it. <laughs> but the interesting part of that is that they sucked in all of the Opus packets that we hold. And do not worry, 3GPP, we are not going to do anything nasty with them. Uh, the fact that you're building on our technology is awesome. The fact that they're building on our technology is a vindication of the technology, but it's also a vindication of the IP research we did. It demonstrates it's safe to use. More than that, you hold patents, we hold patents, and believe it or not, in the industry, for the most part, when two parties hold patents, they're much less likely to sue each other, not more. Trolls run around and sue. Practicing entities, true practicing entities, virtually never do. In fact, you're really only taken seriously if you have the patents. Getting the Opus patents was probably one of the, the most important things we'd ever done in terms of our business development because suddenly so many more people were willing to talk to us. The reason being, the patents themselves were so important but it was a recognition that this is the way the game is played and you're playing by the rules. We recognize this pattern. This is a serious pattern. This is the pattern that all of our contemporaries are following. You're following the pattern too. We will take you seriously. You're now one of the codec developers. We know how to deal with you. This is a culture and a language we understand. 
Now, we hold these patents defensively, of course, and we can use them defensively if need be, and that's the only way they would ever be used. Um, but it's, a, it's coming from the free software world, especially as a person who believes that there should not be software patents, Theoretically, whether they're a good idea or not, they really shouldn't be because in practice they're a disaster. It, it, it still feels very strange to say that. It feels wrong to say that. And yet at the same time, it's been a benefit to everyone involved. So we're going to go with that for now. Evan Moglin says it's okay, so it must be okay. Uh, oh yeah, the Tim telling me I wasn't allowed to work on containers anymore. Uh, Tim is not my boss at uh, Mozilla or Ziff.org. He's, he's a friend. He came into the organization to work on Dala uh, around the time that we were working on Fiora. He had he had long term, long vision. Um, another thing that happened when we got breathing room from the VP uh, onto being bought by Google was, was like, I want to update the container. And Tim said, No. It's like, I want to update the container. And Tim said, No. I'm going to call a transog, I'm going to fix these things, these things, these things, and I'm going to use this to bury the hatchet with the Matroska people. We can get together and finally unify everything. Tim said, no, uh, you really shouldn't do that. So I did. I contacted Steve Long of the Matroska project, said, I've got these great ideas for unifying things. We can all work together. We'll bury the hatchet. And two days later, literally two days later, Google announced that they had chosen Matroska as the basis for WebM. So, mm -hmm. oh, that looked really opportunistic, didn't it? Um, so that didn't happen either. And then Tim came back and said, I'm not going to let you work on containers anymore. And I said, you're not my boss. He said, I'm still not going to let you work on containers. And that's where things have been. So there, there is no transog. We're still working with the original log. Um, what other fun things have happened? Because um, I promised you clickbait, and there really hasn't been an awful lot. Uh, there have been a couple good Steve Jobs stories. Oh, Steve Jobs. The, the last Steve Jobs story was that uh, before we began work on Opus and we're still working on Vorbis. Uh, probably in the middle game, Vorbis had been around for about 10 years. We were doing integer decoders, integer encoders. I had just written a one-off work for hire for a company called Mercora, very high-speed encoder, uh, integer encoder for Vorbis for their platform. Uh, Spotify had started using Vorbis. And, uh, and we actually got a contact from Steve Jobs, not the other way around. And he wanted to know what our licensing terms were and uh, wrote back and said, it's free to do. And so there were clarifying questions. Well, what about in this case? If we did this, this, and this, is it free? It's like, yeah, free to do. We're allowed to do this with it? Yeah, it's, it's free to do. And it turns out that in the background, they were negotiating better terms uh, for licensing uh, AAC from the MPEG consortium. <laughs> <laughs> and we were just the leverage. But uh, that's, uh, that's documentable. In, uh, documentable evidence that uh, that we kept MPEG prices down. So if we've done nothing else, we at least did that. <laughs> uh, what time is it? Oh, okay, I'm over. Um, maybe, maybe throw things open now, because I didn't deliver you enough clickbait. And certainly once the live stream ends, there's a whole bunch of stuff I'm willing to talk about that I'm not going to go into here without a beer. Um, <laughs> But uh, anything, anything from the uh, assembled group? There's got to be something. I didn't talk that much about AV1. That's the big thing happening right now. It is a big, exciting codec. It, uh, it, uh, there's a lot of sausage making involved in that one. So I am reasonably happy with how it's turning out. Uh, certainly in terms of positioning. But this is the strongest we've ever been. Intel just released an encoder for AV1. That's great. Yes? Yeah, so I'm uh, wondering a little bit about the you talked a little bit about the, who the members of zip.org is, yeah. <clears throat> and uh, as far as I knew when I walked in here, that was you. Oh! I said there are more. Oh, yeah. Well, like I said, members come and go in a sense. We really do operate a lot like a coffee shop. Coffee shop. The primary, the, the primary uh, uh, responsibility uh, perk, if if you will, about, of being a member of ZIF.org is you're expected to do some work. And so we don't actually have hordes of people trying to join. Uh, it literally does boil down to, does, does the existing membership trust you to have commit access? Uh -huh. That's usually pretty easy to get. Um, but the trigger is always someone has to ask. It's like, hey, can I have commit access to do this? Well, what are you planning to do? Well, I'm planning to do this. And uh, it's usually the response is, sure. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Like, Peter didn't realize that there was any reason to have it. He was complaining that his uh, Debian patches weren't being upstreamed during our releases. 
And I said, oh, yeah, well, I, there are reasons for that. There, none of them are good. And I said, would you like commit access? And he looked worried for a second. <laughs> and he eventually said, okay, and he's, uh, yeah, he's getting commit access. I would have done it last night, except I <laughs> left my power supply in Oslo. <laughs> um, yes, the, the membership of zips.org really is, is, uh, is uh, defined by who, who has source, uh, who has source access, um, and, and not much more. So we have active and inactive members. If you count people who commit every day, probably on the order of 10. If you talk about people who have commit access and commit monthly, it's probably closer to 30. If you talk about people who have been members at one point or another in the past and who would be welcome back at any time, it's probably closer to 100. Uh, so how, how does this um, uh, compare with the uh, AD1? Uh, oh, I see. Um, the, our active AV1 team is smaller than Google's, probably smaller than Netflix and Intel, and possibly larger than everyone else, possibly even Cisco. Um, I would say, let me think, me, Tim, uh, using TD, until just recently, uh, Jean-Marc, eight committers every day, mm. maybe as many as 12. Because I was just uh, counting people who were actually people that I've talked to recently, like while I've been on the trip, and there are more than that actually. So yeah, yeah. Th that's the rough order. So you know, yeah. even if you are not uh, directly involved in the hardware mm -hmm. development, do you know if there is any uh, concrete hardware yes. uh, that is coming out and in which time frame and who? Oh, there's a, he, the answer is yes, I can answer that. I have to think about how much I'm allowed to. There are a couple NDAs in there that I have to be aware of. Um, I would say probably five separate decoder implementations. I don't know when the first hardware encoder will appear. And those would be genetically distinct different companies not actually talking to each other except through the specification process, uh, hardware decoders in silicon. Um, I think. Yeah, that's probably, that's probably the best answer that I can get at the moment. Uh, so can you say anything about how the everyone organization came together? Because it, it looks like there has been a couple of hatches. Oh, there yes. Uh, well, I mean, there's always a hatch to be buried where there's money to be made. You can bury <laughs> any number of hatches under a pile of money. Um, at Mozilla, we had spent some amount of time trying to collect a similar kind of organization around development of DALA when Andreas Gall was still uh, uh, our uh, chief technology officer. And Google, as it turns out, had long been working on the same thing in the background. I do not know a lot about it. Even the Mozilla people who are in the room with their lawyers on a regular basis do not know a lot about it because Google is fairly tight-lipped about these things. Um, but they had been working on it a long time. We had some warning um, that it was coming together. Um, lots of vague things of we can't uh, we, we have been working primarily through the IETF in Mozilla and ZIF. Um, that was our preferred organization for a long time as the fact that MPEG is kind of structurally unable to make a royalty-free baseline of everything. The IETF is structurally designed such that it's much harder to subvert the process if you say this is going to be royalty-free. Um, it's not proof to it but at least in the IETF you have a lot better tools and handles to pull on to make sure that people don't corrupt the process. Uh, patents are something that you can think about throughout the process in the IETF. The IETF has rules about if you're in the room, you have to devolve the IP, whereas MPEG doesn't. Um, so we had been working through the IETF and Google had been uh, reticent to support some of those efforts. But they had been making cryptic comments along the lines of, we're not supporting this for a good reason, just wait. And then they did what Google often do, is even in their open source projects, probably this is my number one complaint with Google, their open source projects are completed. 
rolled up into a tarball and then thrown over the wall in a lot of ways. And they did, to some extent, the same thing with AOM. They announced that AOM was, was happening. We had very short warning about it. And I think it's because of the last few hatchets all got buried together and then it was ready to go and they announced it before anyone could back out. Uh, I don't think backing out actually was, was a, real, uh, a real worry, but uh, they've been working on it a long time and I think it came together rapidly all of a sudden at one point when the company did finally decide that no, we've come to the conclusion, you know, we've invested in HEVC, but boy, we're getting more and more worried about HEVC licensing, not less. Um, HEVC licensing is still getting worse. I think every commercial streamer in the market is surprised by that. For, for all the articles saying, oh, HEVC is gaining ground, gaining ground, it is, but I think AV1 is going to steal a lot of those people out of the gate simply because you don't have to build the same kind of uncertainty into your business model the way, and I'm talking in terms of business, I'm talking in terms of large corporations, but at least this is a case where you go from an individual, you're not being sued because you're poor, to you're going to an individual who has every right to use this technology, and maybe Google doesn't care, but I sure as hell do. Yay, we're over time by 25%. Do I hear it at 30? <laughs> no. And then, then there will be beer and less live stream and more story. Perhaps. Yeah, that's cool. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. That's a presentation. Um, I have a small announcement to make myself. Uh, oh, okay. Shall I get out of the way? I was uh, talking to heading the program committee for EuroBC Con 2019 at uh, These are the preliminary flyers. Which you want to go, you want, uh, basically, for if people want to submit for the conference, if you're interested in talking to that, first of all, just be able to flyers out here. Um, next, let me, uh, we will come up with something. Hopefully, some something will happen tonight. But <laughs> On the last Thursday is. Uh, Public holiday, so yeah. We'll we'll come up with something. Right now, I'm still sorry, I'm going to respond from that. Yeah. Yeah. So, we're good to go.